uh, we don't have that many people, so that's good. It's um, it's going to be more more uh, private, but good that you're recording so so we can you can show it to to other people. Um, I uh, recently delivered this presentation at a conference as recent as just last week, uh, actually Tuesday last week at the All Things Open conference. It's a very large uh, conference uh, about all things open source, the open source software industry in general. And um, it was good to, to be back into, um, you know, in-person events. I went to the same event uh, last year and we only have a few people. Uh, this time we had around 2000 people uh, at the conference and multiple tracks and, and events. And uh, I, uh, my session was pretty much the first session uh, of the event or just after the, the main keynotes, uh, because it's a general kind of a status of where we are in terms of uh, open source software. You know, they're kind of like the latest trends, the latest um, status in terms of the uh, open source industry. So I know we have potentially very different audiences here, uh, some with a lot more knowledge than, than others in terms of the uh, open source software. So I'll try to, to make it uh, very generic. Uh, I think if you uh, are new to open source, uh, you're gonna learn a lot of things. If you are uh, expert and even contributor to open source software, I think you're also gonna find some interesting uh, data here. So if we move to the, to the next slide, um, just a quick uh, introduction. I've uh, been in the open source space for more than 10 years, directly working with open source technologies and uh, open source communities, open source organizations. Uh, my background, it's been uh, uh, as a product manager uh, responsible for uh, software products. Um, by the way, talking about universities, uh, there's not a major or a minor in product management. This is one of those uh, roles in the technology in the space that uh, it's very important because you are responsible, you own the products. And, uh, but there's nothing, you know, there's really no college education for, for this. Uh, product managers come from different paths. In my case, uh, I was uh, working very closely with sales as a sales engineer and then a solution architect. So I was, you know, I was going side by side with the sales team and doing the technical sale, right? Going and explaining the details uh, on the different software offerings. I've been working with kind of cloud computing, software as a service uh, products and, and open source. So from that moving to kind of being responsible and own, owning the, the, the product lines, uh, moving to product management. I still do a lot of product management, uh, but mainly in the last couple of years, I became an evangelist and uh, uh, especially open source evangelist. And, you know, my job is this, is, is going and, and doing presentations. I, I write blog posts and uh, uh, I'm invited to write articles, guest articles or interviews. Uh, I love that part of my job because I, you know, keep learning, keep researching things. And, and articulating what I learned in, in, in a way that it's easy to, to understand. I was just this morning finishing a, 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 an article that is gonna be published in, a, in one of the publications. I'm very excited about that, TechCrunch, which is one of the most popular. So, so that's what I do uh, in parallel with being responsible for, for the software. So if we move to the next slide, by the way, your, all my contact details, feel free to, to reach out, you see them on the screen. Um, let me start with the stars there. Uh, as an introduction for open source. And um, I said, you know, there's a ton of open source software, right? There are actually millions of open, free, available software for you. Uh, so I was thinking, well, what would be a good analogy, right? Something that there's a lot. I said, well, it had to be stars, right? But then just doing a little bit of uh, research, uh, there are millions, or actually billions, trillions of the stars in the universe, right? So maybe not the best uh, analogy there, but uh, but then I said, well, okay, let's look more into our, uh, you know, something closer, our own galaxy, Milky Way, how many? And uh, they're estimating about 400 billion stars. So I said, well, that's probably too much, but uh, but you get the point, right? <laughs> 
if you click uh, again on the slide, Adrian, uh, this is what I meant. Uh, the numbers that you see there, it's the available software for the most part, uh, you know, it's free, available for the most part, open source software available on the main repositories. So if you are coding on JavaScript and Node.js, you go to NPM and there are more than 2.0 million packages there that you can use. Uh, if you are developing in Java programming language, you can go to Maven Central and you know you have more than half a million packages there that you can reuse. So the, the reason why this is growing is because nobody develops anymore in uh, you know from scratch, right? There's a ton of open source software that you can use. Excuse me, Javier, something happened to your volume. I got a message saying uh, on mute. Okay. <laughs> you hear me better now? No? Yeah, you're you're coming through, Javier. You, uh, let me see. I, I see. I noticed something on my microphone there that I looked like I lost the. But if you can hear me, I'll, I'll continue. Yeah, I can hear you. All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, nobody starts from no no one starts from scratch anymore, right? So if you're developing, give me an example. You're developing an app, right? And you know, the new app. What do you what do you want in that app? Well, maybe a user and password, right? That's the first thing on the app. Well, there are thousands of packages and functions that provide the functionality of how to do the user and validation of the password and right. So you can just go and take it from NPM, from Maven, from PyPy if you're developing in Python, if packet list if you are developing on PHP. Nugget if you are developing on C Sharp, .NET, uh, and Ruby Gems if you're developing on Ruby. And uh, and then what else do you want? Well, I want that password to be encrypted. Well, there are other a few thousand options for you to uh, that provide the encryption functionality for your app. So so you get the point, right? Uh, and and people continue to develop and you know contribute back, right? Provides that makes that software available for you. I mean, you can see the numbers there are impressive, right? Especially the numbers below, like the, you know, more than a thousand packages. New, that's new packages, by the way, new packages per day on NPM, right? So when I was trying to make the analogy on the stars, um, you know, that's what I mean. It's like there are more and more open source software available for you. And, you know, I'll obviously invite you to also contribute to, to open source. If we move to the next slide, the, um, you know, the next big thing is like, well, you're going to say, hey, um, okay, that's all just libraries, but what about, you know, more functionality? So the analogy there is with planets, right? Now, I went again and check, you know, how many planets are there, and there are billions, right? All right, well, how about just in the Milky Way? Well, they're about, they're st estimating about 40 billion, right? So 40 billion planets, 400 billion stars, just, just in the Milky Way. So it's like, well, uh, the analogy is not working for me, um, but but uh, I mean even NASA hasn't really verified. I think they verify about four thousand so far, right? Uh, just in our own kind of not a solar system. Obviously, you know the planets in our solar system, but you know kind of in the Milky Way. So if you click again, um, the reference here to planets versus the stars is because they are there's open source software. There's open like the most used or most popular open source software. It's available in these organizations, in these open source foundations. Uh, the most popular ones are what you see on the screen, the Apache Software Foundation, the Linux Foundation, which encapsulates many more foundations, uh, like the AI and Data Foundation, or the Continuous Delivery Foundation, or the Open Software Security Foundation. They are all part of the kind of umbrella and Linux Foundation. Uh, there's also the Eclipse Foundation, and you can see the numbers there. These are, you know a few hundred projects that are very, very popular. And I'm going to give you examples, right? Well, you, you, some of you might recognize Apache, right? There are a number of Apache, very popular Apache projects. Apache HTTP, Apache Spark, 
Apache Cassandra, so these popular databases, Hadoop, and, and many others, right? So most of the software and the critical open source software that most or, or actually all organizations are using today, it's open source software, right? And then there's the commercial side of that where businesses kind of commercialize open source. So, you know, in other words, they are selling free software, right? And of course, you know, they add value, right? They provide technical support and they add other value, but there's a big business now in, you know, kind of working with open source software, right? You know, companies like Red Hat and Terraform and, uh, uh, and many others, MongoDB and, and others, you know, they build multi-billion dollar uh, organizations using open source, contributing back to open source, growing these projects, many of them coming from these foundations, and then continue to, you know, kind of improve them and make them part of their, their business, right? Kubernetes is the other big example, right? One of the most popular open source projects today. If we move to the, the next slide, please. Um, I, I've been working on a survey uh, last year with something that we do um, every year. Uh, last year, uh, we ask uh, professionals, actually also students, but we ask um, people in the industry about the use of open source in their organizations. And um, I'll tell you at the end, but I mean, we're, right now we're running the survey again and we're about to close the survey. Uh, but one important, and I'm, I'll provide you a couple of statistics, but the main thing here is uh, what caught my attention is when we ask, has your organization increased the use of open source software over the last year? This basically meaning all to 2021. And, you know, 77% say yes, 36% say significant, yes, significantly, right? So that speaks about the fact that you know, open source software is here, right? All software is basically built based on open source software or with the build, what I call, what I call the building blocks of open source software. So, so there's not really doubt about, you know, where to go in terms of software, right? If we move to the next slide, please. Um, just to finish here, kind of like the introduction on, on open source. Uh, there are three areas that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and you can split it in many different ways, but I like to kind of group it in, in trees. Just, I think it's easier to remember. We'll, we'll talk about open source support. We'll talk about open source security, and we'll talk about what's happening in today in, in organizations and government, especially US government, uh, because we are maturing. We are becoming uh, you know, more of users and using open source as, as a strategy. So I'll, I'll talk about that in, in, in the next few slides. If we move up to the to the next one. So one important thing to, to understand is uh, you know software develop, development life cycle, right? And this is applicable to all software, but I'm talking specifically about open source software. Uh, in open source, you have communities, right? It, it's volunteers. I mean, you can start being the only developer working on an open source project, uh, but if it's good, if it's, you know, can become really popular, right? And you can have more people contributing to, to your project. Um, I mentioned Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is one of the most active open source projects today. They actually receive hundreds of commits or, or pull requests, basically, you know, suggesting updates to the code uh, hundreds of times uh, per day, per week, right? So, so these projects continue to grow with volunteers, with, uh, you know, engineers, developers from all over the world that, you know, they become experts and they want to improve the, the software. That, that's the way open source works. Um, but a trend today is to automate more your builds, automate more the way you build, you test, you uh, um, apply security to your software. So the releases are much smaller, meaning you uh, release more often, but with obviously less amount of functionality, right? Automation, it's on something that it's called, uh, you know, DevOps now, buzzword DevOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, they are, what that means is that 
you have multiple versions now, right? Uh, you could be deploying daily, basically releasing software daily or you know every few days. So all of a sudden you have many versions of the software. So, so something that is happening today is that, well, uh, open source communities stop supporting older versions and they tell you, you know, we're only gonna support the last two major versions of the, of the software, right? So what happening is if you're using an older version or if you haven't really updated in six months, in a year, it's very likely that your software now it's out of date, right? So, so that's a trend that's happening now. And that what this means is, you know, er everyone doing software, they have to keep up to date. They have to keep updating all the software that they're using. If we move to the next slide, please. Um, and, and, you know, on the open source communities, and, and this is very important, um, not a lot of people know about this, right? Um, there's a point where you say, we stop, as I was saying, you stop supporting the software and that's what it's called end of life, right? Or, or stop supporting that version of the software and that becomes end of life. Before end of life, it's what it's called long-term support. Uh, typically what open source communities do is, you know, they have the latest version, that's the, you know, they, if they are bugs, there's things that they're gonna fix, vulnerabilities on the software, they're gonna apply the fixes, the patches, in the, that, that's the active version, right? There might be another version that they call, you know, for the most part is called maintenance support, maintenance support, which means, okay, only if there's a really, really bad bug, we'll fix it or really high severity vulnerability, we'll fix it, right? So we'll provide the update for that older version. Uh, but then if that version becomes end of life, then the community, the open source community say, well, it's end of life. We are not gonna update it anymore. Even if there's some critical major um, uh, box or vulnerabilities, you know, you have to upgrade to the latest version. That's the one that we're supporting, right? And uh, there are a couple of very important cases over the last year. Uh, AngularJS, the framework AngularJS, which is version one of Angular. After 11 years, it finally became end of life uh, on December 31st, 2021. The same for CentOS, the operating system, the Linux distribution, very popular Linux distribution became end of life at the end of last year. And what happens then is that you might have hundreds, even thousands of apps using AngularJS or using CentOS as the Linux distribution. And all of a sudden, they're not gonna be any more updates, right? So if there's a major vulnerability that can be exploded, right? That hackers can exploit, they're not gonna be patches for those versions. So, so that's a that's a problem, right? And and you know, I pose the question there, you know, can someone provide extended support beyond the long-term support, right? And there's some companies that offer that, uh, but but that's a reality today in in open source software. We move to the next slide, please. These are a couple, just a couple of quick examples. Um, this is actually from the PHP uh, .org uh, website. And you can see every community, every open source community is a little bit different. Uh, PHP does a really nice job on giving you what you see here on the screen is what versions they are supporting. Um, you know, what I call the maintenance support, what you see in green. And then what you see in orange, it's, it's, a, it's a, a version that, you know, still supported, but just for security fixes, right? Just only for something major, major they will update. Otherwise, they'll stop updating that, right? So if we move to the next slide, I have another another example, uh, and that's for Node.js, you know, very popular, right? Node.js, and they also do a nice job uh, publishing and providing the information. You know, one interesting thing, as I said, every open source project is different. So what Node.js is doing, which is a bit unique, is they only provide long-term support, meaning they will provide patches or fixes only for even number releases. So if you see there on the on the slide, release on the table, release 14, it's a long-term support. Not the case for release 15, but then again, 16, they have long-term support. So, so only for even number of uh, releases, so version 14, 16, 18, they provide a longer time support. And in this case, it's basically a year and a half. 
and you can see on the table the you know the, the important to keep an eye on dates important to see you know when the software that you're using it becomes if you're using a long-term support version or not and if it becomes end of life you know the message for you is you know end of life means no more updates <laughs> if we move to the to the next slide and and that's it right that's those are the risks of ignoring end of life right so on patch vulnerabilities if you're not familiar with cve it stands from um uh, common vulnerability, um, oh, I'm forgetting now, exposure. Uh, it's basically an ID that it's provided to a, to a vulnerability. So once it's disclosed, it goes to a central database, uh, what is called the National Vulnerability Database, and, and it's public for everyone. And a, a CV ID, it's, it's assigned to it and you know with information. Um, oh, oh, the other thing is if software is end of life, it doesn't receive updates, meaning that it could start getting in, uh, issues with integrating with newer software, right? It could be incompatibility. Uh, some organizations uh, have IT compliance, either internal or external, where they say, you know, all your software have to be on the latest version. So all your software have to be supported, right? So you might be out of compliance if you are using end of life software. And, and of course it gets much more uh, complex and you will have to do your own your own support, right? Uh, so those are some of the risks of ignoring end of life, uh, open source end of life software. If we move to the next slide. Um, so one thing on, on just, just, this is just in kind of my own experience also with the survey that I was talking about, you know, what are the, the main challenges for organizations uh, when they're using open source software? That doesn't mean that they stop using open source software, by the way. You know, they're continuing and they're actually all increasing the use of open source as you saw on the on the on that, that chart at the beginning. Uh, but these are the three kind of main support challenges, right? Uh, keeping up with updates and badges, right? So I was telling you that you know the release life cycles come become shorter, there are more updates, and you have to keep up with that, otherwise you stay on a long-term support version or an end of life version. So companies have to keep up with that. And by the way, it's not one or two pieces of software, we're talking about potentially thousands of open source libraries that are using their software, right? So that's one challenge. The other one, you know, more generic in terms of support or in terms of software, it's, you know, I need help with my installation. I need help with an upgrade. I need help with uh, scalability or configuring how I scale my, my, uh, my software environment. Uh, and then the third piece is, and this is very important, uh, personal, exper uh, personal experience and proficiency. Um, if you are in the uh, software industry, if you are studying to computer science, uh, software development, uh, you are in the right place to be because uh, there's a need for experience, proficiency for the skills on all this open source software, especially the newer th the technologies. And that's a challenge that all organizations are, are having right now. You know, we are in a strange uh, process or stage in the, in the economy in the US, right? That some people talk about um, recession, there's inflation, there's, uh, um, you know, different things going on, some positive, some negatives. I can tell you, in the software industry and there are layoffs announced by the way yesterday or uh, meta so facebook announced layoffs some other organizations have announced layoffs but i can tell you that there's still thousands and thousands and thousands of unfilled jobs in the software development space All right so great time to be to be to be to be in this space uh can we move to the next slide um, and, and this is just a quick review of what I was talking about, right? Um, when a vulnerability comes, and if you can see on the, on the image there, when a vulnerability appears, um, by the way, you know, typically developers, open source developers dis discover these vulnerabilities and the smart way to do it is they don't say anything, right? They actually work on the fix. And once they have the fix, that's when they disclose publicly the vulnerability, a CVE is assigned to it. Uh, and you say, hey, you know, with this fix, 
just apply this patch or this version of the software and, and you, will, you will be all right. So uh, when people say, oh, you know, open source is not safe, believe me, like more than 95, 98, 99% of the vulnerabilities, they all already have a fix. The issue, again, it's about the speed and making sure that you have the latest versions of the software that includes all those fixes, right? Uh, one example, and this, this, just, this just happened basically 10 days ago, uh, OpenSSL. OpenSSL, it's a very critical, very heavily used uh, technology. It's, it's actually a library uh, for uh, web networking, right? Uh, access proxy on, on uh, web applications. Um, they had a major, major zero day vulnerability in 2014. Uh, 2014, which is now, you know, a while ago. And that affected thousands of uh, organizations all over the world. Uh, the vulnerability was called uh, Heartbleed. And there's even a logo. If you Google Heartbleed, there's even a logo. And it was a big, big deal back in 2014. And it was like one of the major, the first kind of major vulnerabilities in open source software, at least publicly known vulnerabilities in open source software. And that created a, basically an industry around uh, security in, you know, securing open source software, right? A lot of companies, uh, there are a lot of companies, many of them working on open source software that develop software to help you secure your open source software. Uh, well, that was 2014, uh, as I said, created basically almost created an industry. Uh, and this year uh, they announced that there was gonna be a critical vulnerability. So everyone got really scared. And uh, on November 1st, they announced it was not one critical vulnerability. It was actually two, <laughs> but, but not critical. Consider high severity vulnerabilities. And they provided the fix, the patch, and say, look, you just have to update to version 307. That's the, that's the, good, that's the good one, right? Don't stay with 306, upgrade to 307. So, um, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, it's the way that it's happening today. It's, you know, you probably heard also about the um, uh, Log4j vulnerability, you know, created a lot of awareness, even created some uh, government hearings, uh, Congress, congressional hearings. Uh, so, so that's, a, I mean, in my, in my point of view, it's creating a lot of awareness and it's creating a lot of initiative. So, so that's, that's a good thing, right? That's something, some good positive to take out of, out of that. Uh, if we move to the, to the next slide. So that's the that's a good segue into security, right? Uh, that's the situation with the the open source security today in the industry. Everyone is talking about S bombs, software bill of materials, and and the nice now looking into a better analogy here. Uh, you know, you go and buy any product today, uh, especially food, uh, and it has a a list of nutrients, right? It's printed, it's it's mandatory to get printed the list of nutrients and you know how many how much sugar and you know the fat and calories and all of that. Uh, that's the equivalent in software, a uh, software bill of materials. Basically give you a list of all the other software that it's included in what you are getting. And you know just like the nutritional facts of your uh, of the product that you are buying and you're eating some people might care about the calories some people might not right some people might look at the table some people might not well we want the same thing in software when when there's an issue with open ssl or log 4 j be able to go back to that software bill of materials sbom and say oh yes i have it here 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 so you can easily go on and apply the patches and fix it right so there's a lot of initiatives now there's open source software that basically run scan uh, installations and tells you, you know, what software is there and in what versions, and and you can even add the, the factor of, you know, even identifying vulnerabilities. Uh, and that's the second point: security scans. You know, their software uh, it's called SCA, Software Composition Analysis. Uh, there's open source software. There's commercial software that basically does a scan in your your applications, your development. And it tells you, you know, your list of open source software, what versions, and if they have vulnerabilities, right? And the key, uh, the key here, of course, is 
you know, one thing is to identify it, the other thing is to go on and apply the fixes, which typically is just applying the, the, the next version of the, of the software. If we move to the next slide, This is an example uh, of the issue with security in open source software. So I was telling you that no one starts from scratch anymore, right? So you use all the open source software. Well, all open source software, or all software uses older software now, which uses other software and other software, and it's a big chain. And that's what I'm, it's basically showing there on, on that chart there. Uh, you can read there Lodash. Lodash is basically the most used library on JavaScript, uh, which means every point that is connecting there on the on the image to Lodash, it's basically software that uses Lodash that then another uses and another uses and all those you know weird web of uh, connections there. Uh, they are all interdependent. So so where I'm going with this is. If there's a vulnerability in one of those dependencies, is what is called the library dependencies, then you know we have to go and fix it, right? Uh, imagine a vulnerability on Lodash. Uh, we haven't had one in a long time, but uh, if there's a vulnerability in Lodash, that means that you just not only have to go and fix one or two things, you have to go and fix you know thousands of other open source that happen to be used in Lodash, right? <laughs> So, so that's the situation with open source software, but it's but it's generic, right? It's for open source uh, for software in general. Uh, one of the issues about commercial or proprietary software is that you don't have visibility of any of this, right? With open source, you can go and you know scan. You actually can go and look at the code and look at the dependencies. So, so you, I mean, it's open. You can go and see it. With commercial or proprietary software, you only get you know, kind of like the binaries, right? Or just, just the executables of, of the software. So you will have to trust that they are applying security. So that's another good business case or another use case for the SBOMs, for the software bill of materials. Give me my list of ingredients, right? I'm buying this, I wanna see the content of that, that software. We move to the, the next slide. So there's been a lot of initiatives and that's 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 really up to date information uh, for you. Um, the, there's been a, what is called a mobilization plan. Uh, some of the top uh, technology companies like Google, like Microsoft, like IBM and, and, and others, uh, they got together. They actually had a meeting in the White House uh, after the Log4j and after the, the other um, vulnerability um, um, I'm forgetting now the name, um, the Colonial Pipeline uh, ransomware. Remember that there was like really no, you know, gas stations working because of the because of the, that hack, and then the Solar Winds. Solar Winds is what I was thinking. Uh, so you know, there's got the attention of the U.S. government, right? And there were even hearings about it, and and they got together the top technology companies and the top. Um, open source organizations like the Linux Foundation and the Open Source Software Security Foundation. And they got together, they discussed it, they created work, uh, working groups, and then they got together, right? And, and they came out with a plan. Uh, and that plan has 10 streams, what you see there on the screen, 10 different uh, uh, working groups. They actually got budget, you know, companies like Google donated like, I believe like $5 million and Microsoft and others. So they have actually budget to go and hire engineers, developers, um, architects, and start working in these initiatives. So uh, I recommend you to take a look at that, the, the Open Source Software Security Mobilization Plan. There's a you know like a 20 page uh, document with, that explains what they're gonna do and the initiatives. Uh, let me just highlight quickly a couple of them, um, going and reviewing the top open source software, very important, right? So if the top open source software that most people use, it's secure, doesn't have vulnerabilities, that's a good thing, right? So that's that's one of the streams. The other one is to promote the use of software bill of materials, the SBOMs. Uh, another one interesting, you, you probably don't know about this one, move to memory safe languages. 
So a lot of the legacy software, I mean, is still very used. Uh, C and C++ is heavily used today, right? Uh, especially because it's very lightweight on embedded systems, on IoT, for IoT software. Uh, C, and especially C++, uh, is, is very popular, right? Because it's very lightweight. You're not going to need a lot of hardware resources. But one of the issues with C and C++ is that it's very easy to have issues uh, related to memory, right? Like overflows and, and memory, which they are way, that's, those are ways to hack to get into the software. So there was a bit, I was a bit surprised by this, but there is basically an initiative to kind of replace a lot of the critical infrastructure that it's on C and C++, move it to other languages. Uh, another lightweight language is called Rust. And even in the Linux kernel today, they are already updating and replacing some of the code with, with um, you know, code in Rust as opposed to C and C++. So I found that very interesting. Uh, and, and they're going to continue to do that as part of this mobilization plan. If we move to the next slide, and I think I have only like five more slides for you. So uh, um, I hope this is this is getting interesting. Uh, and there's a lot more to, to research here. Um, I'm just going to go and talk about some of the, the most recent initiatives. Um, this ISO uh, 5230, uh, it's also known as the Open Chain Standard. Um, it's, it's basically a, a guide. Um, well, I mean, it basically it's applicable for compliance about checking license. Uh, I forgot to mention about open source. Uh, open source is not open source if it doesn't have a license, an open source license. If you find software that doesn't have a license file, doesn't have a description of a license, that means that it's not open source. Even though you got it free and available, it means that the owner of that code can come back and you know, request compensation or other things. Uh, but open source software have licenses. You probably heard, some of you might heard of, of the Apache license or the MIT license. That basically tells you, you know, it's the, it's the copyrights, right? And it basically tells you, you know, you can do whatever you want with the software. There are others more restrictive that say, well, you can only use this software if what you're gonna do is gonna continue to be open source software. And, and there are many different types. Um, so it's very important, especially for commercial software, that the open source software that they're using has the appropriate licenses. So you know this is this is another initiative. A lot of companies are working into that, right? It, it's important to keep an eye, especially if you're reselling software, that that legally you are compliant. If we move to the to the next slide, and by the way, that's information that you're going to see also on, on a software bill of materials. So uh, it's a build here. Uh, it's a couple of clicks. Um, this is a, just a quick summary, and, and I'll invite you to, if you're interested, to uh, to take a look. Um, so the first thing was this is uh, uh, meet 2021, the white the executive order, right? So it's a White House executive order that is, it's called uh, the Improved Cybersecurity. And what this created, what I mentioned earlier, basically these working groups, and, and it really had actually some mandates with deadlines within the government, the US government and agencies, government agencies to, 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 you know, to define some steps around securing their software, including open source software. So, so this was really, this really, you know, when it comes from the White House, people pay attention, all these major technology companies got involved, got invited to the White House, and there's something, <clears throat> excuse me, they're doing something about it. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, after the Log4j vulnerability, they said, hey, if your company has Log4j uh, and it's not been patched, you can, you know, you can be hacked, right? You can get ransomware. You can lose or expose, someone can expose data of your customers. So we actually, if you don't patch it, if you don't fix it, we are gonna take some legal actions, right? And this has precedent, by the way, uh, some of you might remember Equifax had a major vulnerability. They ended paying something like $700 million, uh, which uh, um, I, I was one of the one of the people that got exposed to my personal uh, information there. I applied for the for the compensation. I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> so someone got the $700 million, but uh, 
but there, there are definitely legal actions that the FTC can, can take. Another interesting uh, government initiative is this medical device security bill. Uh, last time I checked, uh, it, passed Kong, it passed the House, but it hasn't passed the Senate. They, might, they are talking about kind of putting it together with, with another bill. Uh, but this basically tells you, you know, medical devices are very important, right? So if medical devices get hacked, I mean, people can lose lives, right? Actually, they are documented. I wrote a blog post about this. They are documented uh, cases where there was one in the, in the United Kingdom where because a hospital got hacked via medical device, they asked for some ransomware. So, you know, machines weren't working. And you know, apparently someone lost their life because the machines weren't working, right? So, you know, very serious stuff. You know, now that everything is has a chip and, and there are a lot of medical devices, very, very important to be on the latest versions of the software and patch and have, you know, all applied all the necessary security. So so there's this bill is gonna make it really more mandatory and, and again, including the 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 publishing of a software bill of materials. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, there's also a build up on, on I believe, three, three bullet points. Um, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, CISA, uh, provide, uh, basically gave a directive saying, all government agencies have to disclose vulnerabilities. It's mandatory, right? So if you get hack, if you discover a vulnerability, you have to let everyone else know. So, you know, everyone is doing this or has been trying to do this in the open source space could also sometimes you know you you need the, the the government to kind of force uh in this case it's just for the government agencies but forcing them to disclose vulnerabilities uh there's a more recent actually this is from september so basically a year uh, a month and a half less than a month and a half just a few weeks ago uh this is an initiative by two bipartisan initiative by two uh senators um uh, senator peters and i forgot now the other senator one democrat one uh, republican and this is the Securing Open Source Act. And it's about best practices in the, in the government. And they said, look, you need to have a, a framework about security. You need to kind of guide and train people about all the steps to, to have open source security. Uh, implement an open source program office, OSPO, an open source program office, just like the private sector is implementing, you know, an office where they can drive all the strategy around open source security and not security also for strategic and, and hire open source software experts, right? Uh, this, this I, I'm writing a blog post about, about this because this actually hasn't really gone through, through the process. So it's still far to become uh, a law, right? But, but it's the first time, it is actually the first time in the US government that open source is recognized as a key part of the industry, right? And, and uh, you know, when you read the, the, the bill, it actually talks about, you know, how critical and how important open source software, just like all other software, it's, it's for, the, for the nation. So very, very interesting, very interesting. Uh, and then just, just recently also, just basically two, three weeks ago, there was a, uh, the US government published the national security strategy. They talked about, the strategy about, you know, with China and with Russia and all the kind of national security stuff, but they also talk about open source software, right? How important is becoming open source. And they talk about the kind of aligning uh, the government with open source organizations with, uh, with the community. So, you know, they can improve in uh, the security of open source. If we move to the next slide, please. And I realize we're almost running out of time. I think it's just two more slides. Uh, just really quick here, uh, op organizations moving away from government now into, well, this is something that the government wants to do. Uh, becoming like organizations and how mature they are in the use of open source software. So there are kind of four elements there that you see on the chart. Everyone starts as a consumer, right? They're just using open source software. Then they can become more of participants and contributors where they see that you know it's great to have people that are familiar, that are experts on this open source software. They can contribute back and at the same time help my own company with their expertise. And we can even open source some of our projects, right? Why would we keep them behind closed doors where other people can benefit of it? And by the way, our customers can benefit of it and then you know, you know, be happier with, with services and the software that we provide. So companies are moving in this direction. 
uh, organizations are moving into, you know, their leaders like Google and Microsoft and, uh, and others, uh, but, but they're moving all in that direction. And it's all based on what I would just call OSPO, Open Source Program Offices, uh, similar to, you know, organizations having a security office. Now they're moving in the direction of also having an open source office, right? And, and at some point that uh, in the in the in universities, hopefully we'll read more about you know how to become a, you know a chief open source officer or a chief open source security officer things like that. Uh, if we move to the to the next slide, and and I think that's uh, that's about it. I think I'm going to invite you to to the survey. Um, with the survey that I was mentioning, uh, we, we had some good information about the, the use of open source in, or in by industry and OSPOS, open source program offices, it's at 21% of the healthcare pharma uh, organizations, according to last year's survey, they have now an open source program office. There's something called inner source, uh, which is basically do just like open source, but within the within your organization. Uh, you have the same best practices within your organization and then open source your software. So we see a, that's another trend. We see organizations doing inner source projects uh, and the banking, insurance and financial services industry is kind of leading that. They, they see that they can do more like the open source communities internally and then, and then externally. If we move to the next slide, Ah, I almost forget the, the jobs report. I, I did mention that, you know, it's a good time to, to be an engineer and a software developer. Well, look at this statistics, right? 93% of employers, uh, you know, finding a difficulty finding talent on, on OSS, open source skills. 77% uh, of organizations are growing the use of uh, cloud native technologies. Well, I didn't talk about cloud native, but basically it's all kind of container based technologies. All of that is it's open source. And 81% and of open source professionals plan to add certification. So, you know, the more an expert, the more you know uh, on open source technologies, uh, the more opportunities are, are going to be for you. And, and yes, cloud container technologies are hot. Also Linux, also DevOps, uh, and of course cyber cybersecurity. Not to mention uh, AI, machine learning technologies. So, so what you see there on the screen. Great time to be a, 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 a software developer and engineer. As I said, even with weird economy, there are a lot of jobs out there. And if we move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, just, just a quick uh, kind of summary takeaways from the presentation, right? So we talked about the life cycle. I hope you. Uh, got that clear in terms of the long-term support and end of life. You have to pay attention to that in open source. Uh, there are lessons from like the sentence, CentOS and Angular end of life because you know that was actually end of life, not just the version. It was the project, right? And you have to move, uh, you have to migrate to other technologies. So, so another reason to keep an eye on on end of life software. Um, we talked about security and how you know the really the right way to do is to you know, keep up to date with the fixes because most vulnerabilities, and I, 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 this is completely true, like a good 99, 98% of the vulnerabilities already have a fix. So all you have to do is just keep up to date with, uh, keep up to date with, uh, with, with the patches and with the releases. And, and yeah, I mean, industry-wide and, and with the government, there are a lot of initiatives around cybersecurity and, and especially about open source security. So that's already encouraging to, to see. And if we move to the to the next slide, uh, I show you this slide, right? We ask uh, if the organization has increased the use of open source software over the last year. If you click it, I have results for this year. And as I said, we're about to close the survey. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you will see the, it was 70%, 77% was high, right? Well, now a year later, and this is basically covering most of 2022, uh, organizations are even increasing more the use of open source software, right? So, you know, very, very, very good, very positive. If we move to the to the next slide, uh, I wanted to share with you the, the survey. If you scan the QR code or you go to that URL, 
uh, it's going to take you between five and 10 minutes uh, if you are working with open source software. Uh, and actually, one thing that we're doing, we, we did this survey in collaboration with the Open Source Initiative. Uh, and we are donating, for every completed survey, we are donating $1 to the World Food Program. Uh, you know, very serious and complete, uh, really good organization. They actually got the a Nobel Peace Prize in 2020, the, the United Nations World Food Program. So a uh, very serious organization and they are, uh, you know, helping uh, with the meals on, on uh, areas of uh, conflict. Uh, I know they are in Ukraine and in Haiti and, and other places. So, so good, another good reason to go and, and check it out. By the way, when you check the survey, you're going to learn also about open source because it's going to give you all the list of open source technologies and and you know what's happening in the industry uh, on the different categories, by the way, not just like programming languages, but it could be databases, it could be uh, cloud native, it could be uh, you know DevOps and other technologies. So uh, if we move to the next slide, um, just want to thank you for the for the invitation. Uh, there's my my contact details. Um, if there are questions, happy to to spend a few minutes with. Uh, if there are any questions. Yes, I think there are a few questions. There, there's a question. You said something about uh, uh, Rust. Rust. Yep. Yeah. Uh, could could you uh, reiterate uh, reiterate that what you had said about Rust? Yeah. So the programming language Rust, R U S T. Uh, it's kind of very lightweight uh, programming language. Doesn't require a lot of uh, uh, processing and you know hardware resources. So uh, very interesting that they are replacing some of the code, available code on important open source projects, from C++ or C, replacing it with you know the code coding in Rust. The Linux kernel, um, which by the way is still driven by their maintainer, Linux Torvalds, the, basically the inventor of Linux. Uh, uh, he's been, Linux has been around now for 31 years. He's still working every day with, on, the, on the Linux kernel. He basically announced last year that they were gonna start replacing some components uh, uh, now on Rust as opposed to C++. So it's happening, it's, it's definitely happening. Okay. And then, then my other question was that uh, you mentioned that there are a lot of job opportunities in open source. Is that with the organizations themselves or with uh, companies that actually use open source software? Uh, both. Both. Uh, no, both. both. So, so my recommendation is like if you're a developer, you know, go on and get closer to some of those open source communities, right? So go to uh, GitHub. And, and you know where the code is and start read the their instructions every community works a little bit different right they have like their uh, you know the, the rules of engagement and the code of conduct and things like that and and get familiar right I mean you're not going to start kind of going and making major updates but you're going to start helping out becoming familiar sometimes even help with documentation or you know some graphic design and and that's how you can start learning about though, that open source software now, uh, companies are in high demand for people with those skills, right? So, you know, any cloud native containerized uh, technologies, as I said, uh, DevOps, security, open source security, um, what else? AI, machine learning, uh, mm -hmm. there are a ton of, a ton of jobs in, in those areas. Uh, security, AI, machine learning, definitely are gonna be around for a long, long time. <laughs> right. And, and you said they're working on uh, certifications for... Uh, the Linux Foundation, uh, for, I mean, there, there are many options there, right? But if you go right. to the Linux Foundation, they provide a number of uh, uh, certifications on, on uh, not just Linux, but on other uh, uh, technologies. Uh, it helps, right? Like if you put in your resume that you have a certification, definitely helps. Uh, but I will also do it just for the... the you know, the, the learning experience, right? right. Um, the thing with technology is that, that it gets outdated really quickly, right? So, you know, a course that something maybe you, you did a couple of years ago might not be, uh, you might not have the latest information anymore, right? 
uh, you know, there are a ton of courses out there. Um, some of them are outdated, but you know, that's, that's a reality, right? Yeah, so I, I, my interest is in, uh, in cloud and I, I was working on certifications for AWS and also a, uh, eventually work on a certification for Linux Plus. But yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at the Linux, uh, Linux uh, Foundation. Yeah, no, I mean, Google um, uh, has a lot of good uh, certifications, AWS as well, of course, and, and many others, right? I mean, Red Hat is another good company in open source that offers mm -hmm. training and free training. Mm -hmm. um, uh, IBM, another one. I mean, there's, you go to IBM, there's a ton of stuff just, just free. Um, so so good, good, a lot of good materials, right? Like, I, I, if, if people are, you know, if you have the desire to learn, I think there's a lot of good content out there. Um, um, and, uh, you know, it's, I mean, plus, you know, it's always fun to, to learn new stuff, right? So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? So it's getting dark when it's already dark here in the Boston area. <laughs> oh, oh I, I, I used to live in the Boston area. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's getting colder now, and uh, it's uh, now dark by like five o'clock or so. So, yeah. uh, you know, winter is, is coming. <laughs> We're not even uh, through uh, Thanksgiving. But uh, no, I appreciate the, the invitation. I'm always happy to, to talk about this stuff, and uh, let me know if, uh, if you want to do it again. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we were honored to, for you to present to us and some, some very uh, valuable information on the current state. Can we add you on LinkedIn? You have my LinkedIn info there? Yeah. Feel free to Fantastic. Yeah, I, I recorded I recorded the presentation. So, and also I can, I can forward that over to you, Aaron. Thank you, Adrian. No problem. All right. All right well, thank you, guys. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, I will.